It's our great pleasure to welcome to the show Jason Shapiro. Jason is the founder of the Crowded Market Report and just uh, an interview I've been looking forward to for a long time. Jason, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, this is probably one of the most uh, anticipated interviews I've had. Uh, for those who don't know, Jason was actually featured in one of Jack Schweiger's renowned Market Wizards book. He was part of the, what is it, the Unknown Market Wizards? That was it, yeah. Came yeah. out a couple of years ago. That's right. And uh, and now he, he has an illustrious career with lots of great stories. And I've... <laughs> I, I reread the chapter and I realized it was by far and away my favorite chapter in the book. And uh, if I had to pick anyone from that book to interview, it'd be you. So let's jump into it. Um, you have kind of a very un unique uh, start to the markets. Um, why don't you just kind of walk us through where did you grow up? Did you always think you were going to be in the markets? How did, how did, it, how did your kind of s s path towards this role as a crowded market report guy start? Um. Yeah, I grew up in Jersey. Um, did I always think I would be in the markets? I mean, it was one of those things where, like, my dad was kind of into it, and the biggest torture for me growing up was when we ate dinner every night, we had to watch uh, FNN, which uh, I think was the, the predecessor to, uh, you know, CNBC or whatever. Right, yep. Um, and we used to have to listen to that, and it was just painful. And I watch my kids now because I have it on every day. <laughs> And I'm like, these poor bastards got to go through exactly what I went through. Um, but I guess, you know, maybe subconsciously somewhere in there, it, it created some interest in there. Um, if nothing else, because like as a kid, you know, you don't really know what the hell you're talking about. And gee, the stock market seems like where people go to get rich. Right. Right. Um, so that kind of sounded cool to me. Um, in your book, you talked about getting kicked out of a lot of high schools and schools like only you, three. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so when, when did that start and like what what were the reasons like did you just know better or you just couldn't help yourself did i know better <laughs> well you thought you knew they, better they, they knew better yeah um they, i mean the re, you know just insubordination you know right. i was a i was a bad kid <laughs> and so and, you and my parents you know in their struggles you know they kept getting the whole thing of you know, Jason doesn't live up to his potential, you know, that whole thing. Right. And so they tried. My brother went to, uh, went to, a, he was a good kid and he, he did very well. And he went to one of the, the big prep schools, um, and did well there. And they tried to send me there and, uh, it didn't work. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, you know, they sent me to another one that also didn't work. And then they sent me to a private school, um, close to home. And, uh, that didn't work. So back to public school, I went. And then, so you went off to university mm -hmm. and your first year of university sounds like it was a lot of fun, but then you very quickly figured out that you were, you know, you had to do something different. The, the parting was no longer as. I mean, it, it just gets to a point, right? Where you start to grow up and you're like, you know, I, I, and clearly I think I might've talked about in the book, but well, me and a couple of my buddies were, were thrown in jail one night. Oh, and no, I think uh, you mentioned that. Yeah, so you know, just drunken sort of stupidness, and we were we were chucked in the tank overnight, and the things that I witnessed in the downtown holding cell, um, I was like, okay, I, I have to figure something else out because this is not where I want to be. Um, and from that kind of moment on, I, I started taking things a little bit more seriously, and I started taking school more seriously, and I, I just started taking everything more seriously. And, and in a way, I was fortunate. Um, that in high school, I was so out of control that I, I got a lot of that out of my system. A lot of people go to college and they get a little bit out of control. Right. Um, and I kind of like was watching them in college being like, you know, I've, I've done this, you know what I mean? Oh, well, you know, you're, you're doing drugs, whatever, you know, I'm like yeah, I, I was doing that when I was 16, you know? Yeah. Um, and it just seemed boring to me. And, and so, you know, and on top of the fact that I, I want to kind of get my life together, I started taking things a little more seriously and, and take the school a lot more seriously. And, and it was easier because. I was now going to school for something I was interested in. Um, so therefore I had a motivation to focus and, and learn it. And, uh, and, and that's what I did. And then I was doing things outside of school. I was working full time in a business and I was doing a lot of reading on the side. Um, I was got into reading somewhere around then in college and I was just devouring books at the Barnes and Noble um, and really starting to get 
when I look back, probably not really getting a real idea, but at least starting to put in work and starting to understand what it took to do work and, and, and succeed at that. Right. So you're studying finance, but you didn't actually get a job out of school doing finance. Walk us through kind of the next stage in your career. Well, Goldman wasn't uh, recruiting at the University of South Florida. <laughs> so I um, went home and um, delivered Domino's Pizza and delivered the Wall Street Journal for about six months because the only asset I had was a car. Um, and I saved my money and I bought a ticket. I went to Japan and I was like speaking, teaching English in Japan. Right. And then I got a job um, with HSBC. Um, who at the time, I think they still have it, but it was called the International Officers Program, which they had been doing for like 120 years. Um, and they had just first started to hire, maybe try to get some American kids in there because uh, they had bought Marine Midland and you know they were kind of going global and all that. So they were looking to get some other people besides British people in there. I, I can tell you, I can never get that job now because now it's all, you know, these high level MBAs that are getting that job and all that. But because they were just getting into this and out of American people knew what HSBC was, um, I got the job. Um, and that lasted, oh, I think, 18 months before they... And that this is in Japan still? You're in Tokyo? This was in Hong Kong, yeah. Oh, in Hong but Kong. The way that program worked was it was like a five-year training program where they sent you to five different places within HSBC. And then once you got done with that, you kind of got into their executive and you just started moving up the ladder depending on, you know, whatever, whose ass you kissed or, or whatever it was. I never made it that far, so I never found out. But so like in the 18 months I was with them, I was... I want to say I was three months in Hong Kong, then I was three months in Malaysia, then I was like six months in Singapore, um, and then the last six months were in Hong Kong, and then they, uh, is they this showed the, me, Is this the early 90s, Jason? This was the early 90s, yes. Yeah, okay. okay. So before kind of the uh, Asian crisis and everything? Yes. And, no, so and, and that's how I got into trading, was I was in this job, and it's like a commercial banking job, and it was super boring. Um, and it was not really what I wanted to be doing. Um, and, and just like a lot of people that get into the markets this way when they're young, you know, I was bored at my job and, and th there was this bull market going on outside there, you know, and it seemed all very exciting. You know, hey, that sounds like a fun way to make a lot of easy money. Um, so I got involved in, in the Hong Kong bull market sort of in the early 90s. And so what you're, you're saying you got involved, you just started trading a PA? Yes, sir. Okay. And so you, you scrabbled up some money and you started banging around futures. Like how would you, were you phoning? It wasn't online back then. You probably had to phone in your orders and everything. Yes. My, uh, I played on a softball team Yeah, and, uh, one of my buddies who was on the softball team was a broker, um, a Hang Seng index futures broker. Okay. Um, and I called him up one day. I put, I don't know, five grand into the account or something like that which was probably all the money I had and, and said, okay. And the market, I can remember it. The market was like up a bunch and I was like, Oh, well, why don't we sell it? And he's like, well, I don't think that's a good idea. You know, the market's strong. I said, okay, buy it. Like I don't, I didn't know the difference. Um, so we bought it and, uh, it just kind of went from there. You know, I, I went out, I, I always talk about it. I went out that day at lunch to the bookstore. I said, you know, like I said, I had been big into reading at this point. So I was like, I better go get a book because I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I don't know what a futures contract is. So I saw Market Wizards, which at the time was actually, you know, in the bookstore on the shelf. Um, I didn't know that, you know, everybody knows Market Wizards now. And I didn't know what it was then, but it looked kind of cool. An interview with, you know, a bunch of successful traders. That sounds good to me. So I bought it and, and I read it that day. Um, I finished it before I went to sleep. And in the morning I said, uh, yeah, this is what I am going to try and do with my life. That, that's fascinating. Well, but what, what was the feeling kind of fast forwarding to when Jack phoned you or reached out to you and invited you to be on the, his latest version of this book? Like, was it just, it was, a, it was a little weird yourself? because, well, it was weird because, um, you know, at 22, we all used to read Market Wizards and we would quote it to each other every single day. You know, I read that book so many times to this day. I could sit here and it's like, you know, the, watching The Godfather, right? right? I could sit here and quote you that book all day long because I probably read it 30 times, right? Um, and we used to do it all the time. And of course, as a 23 year old, we go, oh, I'd love to be a Market Wizard, right? But then, you know, Jack calls me up and at this point, I'm a 50 something year old and I'm really not looking for anything at this point. You know what I mean? I don't. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not looking to prove anything uh, to anybody. I like to be living a quiet life. I'm not looking to raise money. I'm not looking for any of this stuff. So um, I kind of hesitated. And I was like, eh. and I, I was going out to Boulder to a, a friend's daughter's wedding. And, and Jack lived in Boulder. So I said, you know, why don't we have lunch? So we had lunch and we had a long talk and it was really cool. And um, he was like, oh, I didn't tape any of that. I wish I did. Can I get you on tape? I was like, you know, I, I don't really know, Jack, if I want to do this. I don't really want publicity. And, but my friends were all like, come on, man. You know what I mean? We love Market Wizards. You got to do right. it. It's Jack Schwager. You got to do it. So I did. So I did. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and it's been great. Listen, it's been great. Um, you know, it, it's been fun. I've met a lot of sort of cool and smart and, and, and interesting people because of it. So I'm not going to complain. All right. So you're in, um, you're in the HSBC program, but you start trading futures. Do you eventually just say, that's it. I want to just trade for myself. That is that the next step, step in your kind of evolution? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was silly. Cause it was a, you know, again, it was a bull market and I was young and, and stupid and, uh, therefore leveraging way more than I ever should have been. And like, you know, within six months I made like, I don't know what the number is, but four or $500,000, you know? And I'm like, okay, so if I just keep doing this, then, you know, within three years, I'm George Soros. Right. <laughs> um, so I, much as I didn't like my job before I started doing that, I just completely stopped working. And, um, it was horrible for these people because I was in this sort of elite program that um really reported to the head office the, the very highest part of the head office yeah so these poor people that i was working for in their department or whatever couldn't do anything they couldn't fire me because it wasn't up to them it was up to the head office right and they of course had this whole long process on so i sat there for six months and literally did nothing and these guys would get so frustrated <laughs> I, feel, I feel so bad for them but it was no different than my teachers or anybody else i'd ever worked for you know what i mean i was just a jerk um and when i started making money trading futures it, it became even worse because i really didn't care so they eventually uh i finally got to my six month review with head office and they were like okay pack your bags um and by that time, I had been interviewing already, and I was trying to get a job at, you know, a brokerage house, whatever, Morgan Stanley, whoever, and, and none of them were hiring me. Um, but uh, I ended up getting a job with some institution, you know, like Asian brokerage house, uh, where my job was supposed to be to be trying to get order flow from uh, the U.S. institutions, okay. um, which I did get some of, um, but... Really, I was just trading my own account for most of it. And what, okay, so how, how did that, like, was that almost straight up for you? Like, was it just, it kept getting easy, easy, easy? Like there was, and, and was there any kind of rhyme or reason to your, to your trading or were you just young and bold and going for it? Young and bold and going for it. Okay. And so you're there, you're doing that. Now, eventually, does that end like most people with young and bold and going for it where it blows up? Sure sure does why should it be any different <laughs> right so how does so how does it when does that happen and how big is the blow up oh as soon as the bull market ended i, I lost everything right okay so you lose the only everything. thing i had left the only thing i had to show for it was this sports car that i bought um which i could then no longer pay for the parking because i had lost <laughs> all my money afford, you couldn't afford the parking no and so is, are you in Hong Kong at this time? Where, about this yeah, point, where are you in, living? I'm in, Hong, yeah, I'm, in Hong, I'm in Hong Kong. Okay. So you blow up, like we've all been there. We kind of understand that feeling a young person doing that. What, what do you do from there? Well, I just kept sort of trying to fire, you know, um, save up some money. And then all of a sudden I found this new thing, which was uh, shorting, right? <laughs> and, and it was a, now it was a bear market. And so shorting, and then that was probably the worst drug I ever found. Um, but suddenly started making money on the short side because it was a bear market and, and just went through the same cycle, made a bunch of money shorting and then didn't know when the bear market was over. And when it turned, uh, gave that all back. It, it kind of reminds me of what's going on now. You know what I mean? A lot of people came in after COVID made a bunch of money, just buying anything, right? Lost it last year, started shorting the second half of last year and all of a sudden fell in love with shorting and got, you know, ripped this, this year yeah. because of that, right? Um, I see a lot of what I did and what's going on now. Okay, so at a certain point, you have kind of a revelation about your trading 
is it after this, after you've kind of done it in reverse and you've kind of done the same kind of a cycle or experience where you, you know, you take something too far. Like wh- when do you have the kind of epiphany? I think that after the second time I lost my money, I really started to dig in again, what I think a lot of people do. Okay. This isn't easy. I have to learn how to do this. So I read all the books, you know, Warren Buffett, uh, technical analysis, market psychology, you know, uh, the whole list of books that everybody reads. Right. Right. Um, read them again and again and took some notes and and really tried to put it together and started trading and started doing a little better after that, at least in terms of risk, you know, Um, but was still kind of boom bust for the most part um, for a a good another five, six, seven years. I had great runs and then had crappy runs and great runs and crappy runs and um, finally came to the conclusion where I was like, okay, I've just wasted 10 years because I've gotten nowhere here, right? I've had some good times, but I've gotten nowhere. So if this is what I want to do, then I really got to figure out what the hell I'm going to do because th- this isn't going to work, right? Um, so I went back and I was lucky that I did listen to a lot of the books I read. And so I was pretty diligent in keeping like trading journals and, and all that stuff. So I was able to go back and I took about three months and I went back and went through all my trading journals and really tried to decipher what trades are working, what trades are not working. And I'm not talking about worked once or worked twice. I'm talking about what has worked over time right. and what has not worked over time. Like, hey, this breakout trade made me a bunch of money once, but do these breakout trades work for me over time? Um, and so I went through that whole thing and really tried to eliminate, obviously, the ones that didn't work over time and stick to the stuff that did work over time and started to develop a process. And and during this period, were you trading, or you actually took it off and you in like you research no, your you, that's all yeah. you were focused on. Yes. So you you put your head down, and so when you say you kept your trading journal, does that mean you kept not just like writing comments about things, but you kept every single trade, and you could see your P and L for the various trades? Why I did it, why I put the trade on, where I was going to get out, um, what the final result of the trade was be it a, a I made or I lost um and any other note that I wanted to put on the trade but the most important part was why I, I used to put them into different sections this is a contrarian trade this is a breakout trade you know things like that right okay. um this is a day trade this is a this you know that kind of thing so then I was able to back and go through those different type of trades and see which ones were really working for me now, in hindsight, that trading journal was kind of integral to you figuring out trading. Would you not agree? Yes. And so can I ask what made you have the discipline to make that journal? I was just following what people were telling me to do in these books that I read. You know? oh, okay. and, and a lot of the real good books about this, you know, trading for a living, those type of books mention that you should do that. Right. Um, and so I did. You know, I, I, this is really what I wanted to do. So I was going to do whatever I thought was necessary to make it happen. Um, and not only is it what I wanted to do, um, I feel like it was the only thing that I could do, you know, because I, being an employee w- was clearly not going to work for me. You know, <laughs> um, it, you know, I was never a good, whatever listener of anybody. Right. right. So that clearly was not going to be a good thing for me. So, I was either going to be, you know, a waiter or something, um, which probably wouldn't work either because they would fire me too, but, I, or I was going to try and figure this out. So, right. and I knew that. So therefore I was doing whatever I could do to, to try and at least increase the odds of this happening for me. Um, all right. So you go through this, you do all this research about your trading. What, what is the final conclusion you come about which trades work for you particularly? So I've always been sort of, you know, I've had this contrarian bent to my life. So, and my thinking, my thought process. So I was focusing on contrarian trades, but the key to it really was the difference between being contrarian and just being stupid and just being a wise ass, you know, selling because you think everyone's buying, buying because you think everyone's selling. Um, and, and really the key there is, is price, right? I, just because something goes up a lot, 
doesn't mean that selling it or shorting it is the contrarian trade, right? That, that can just be the stupid trade. You're just getting in the way of a trend, right? right. Um, and, and we've seen this this year um, in mass with like NVIDIA, right? NVIDIA going up and up and everybody trying to short into it because it's ridiculous and, this, and it just keeps going up and up and up and up and, and, and you blow out, right? So I stopped trying to do that and I tried to look for how to actually be contrarian. Um, and the conclusion that I came to was y you don't want to be contrarian price. Um, you want to be contrarian participation, right? So it's not, hey, this thing's gone up a lot, so let's short it. It's more, hey, everyone in the world is long this thing, so let's short it. Um, and so I started looking for how do I figure out how everyone in the world is long this thing. And I started looking for data and I started looking for other things. And, and that's kind of where I went with that. And so from there, your results improved from like they just took off. They did a lot better from there. Yes. It yeah. took a, a little while to sort of uh, really nail down everything, but um, starting in, I would say th th there was a big thing. And after uh, the internet bubble in 99, um, where it was obvious that there was a bubble going on. Yeah. Um, and I was shorting that bubble because all of the signs were there. Um, but the more I started shorting it in the summer of 99 and then the, the NASDAQ went up like, I don't know, 40 or 50% from the summer of 99 until January of 2000. Now my risk management was better now. So I was stopping out, not doing, you know, I, I wasn't going to blow out doing that, but I was losing money. Um, and that's when I sort of found the commitments of traders data. Um, and I noticed that. I wouldn't have shorted that stuff all the way up until January of 2000 had I been following the commitments of traders. So that really had a big uh, oh, so effect like on me. The light bulb went off in terms of what to. Like in terms another, of some data that could, that could really help me. Yeah. Right. Um, um, and so since then, I have used that um, very extensively. And since then, uh, yeah, I've, uh, that's when my trading really started to be very steady. Okay. So I, I don't want to back up just for a little bit, because in the book you talk about trading um, during the time when Nick Leeson was blowing up the Barings Bank. And uh, I know that this was kind of, if, if I got my timeline right, this was before your kind of steady trading, but yet you still had a great trade. Can you kind of, I just, I'm a little bit, I love trading stories and I, and I, and I heard your trading story and I was like, I got to ask him about it. Can you give us a little color on that? Can you expand on, on what you mentioned in the book? So at this point, I had convinced the bank I was working for, the brokerage house I was working for, to let me have a book and let me sort of trade a book. Yeah. Um, and so I was. And I was trading mostly kind of Hang Sang, Nikkei, some JGB stuff. And the Leeson thing happened. And I didn't know anything about Nick Leeson. Um, we knew something was going on because the vol on the Nikkei had gotten to like low single digits, which made absolutely no sense. So there was clearly something wrong there. But And I remember talking about it, but I didn't do anything about it. And then we found out, obviously, uh, what it was, was that Nick Leeson was you know, filling this P&L hole that he had built up by selling options and, and using the premium that he was taking in as an accounting gimmick to fill that and L hole, right? That's right. Selling straddles works well to fix your PL problem. <laughs> right. If your people don't know if they're not paying attention to you, right? So that blew up and he had to liquidate. And the, the trade that I made on that was then, you know, the, the Singapore government came out and said, we're liquidating this entire bearings portfolio right now, today. I mean, they told everybody, right? We're doing this today. So the Nikkei opened. At like I don't remember what the number was, but it was like a fifteen percent discount to cash or something like that, and traded there like the whole morning, right? Okay. And I, you know, went to my boss and I'm like, "Listen, man, this is a gift. These guys said they're going to be done with this trade today. They're getting rid of it today, right?" 
So we can buy the futures and sell, you know, do the cash and carry trade and make a 15 percent, man. You know? So you actually did the risk arb. So up until this point, you were just trading futures, and you actually told them to put on the the not the risk arb, the index arb. Sorry, yeah. you, you told them yeah. to do the index arb. So did you go buy the? So you bought the futures at this big discount to cash, and then you sold the stocks. Did you sell all the stocks, or was there an ETF at the time? No, we were selling the stocks. Okay. Uh, we didn't sell all of them, but I think we sold like whatever, the 20 or 30 biggest stocks in the index or something. Oh, so you just said, okay, we're going to go short the top, you know, 70% yeah, we of the market smart caps. Enough or, okay. We weren't smart enough or even in a position to, to do it the real way. So we just did it as good as we could. Okay. So you do this and then does it bounce back the next day? And like, Oh yeah. Right at the open the next day. <laughs> You're kidding. It was one day and it was gone. Is yeah, it had to be. They, they they told us that they were going to be done selling the next day. But so why don't you think there was like why didn't the index arbs take down the cash to the futures level? I have no idea. Maybe they did. I, I have no idea. Um, well, they it, maybe it was, they, 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 they couldn't get their bosses to agree. You know what I mean? Yeah. People were scared. You know, in well, the I heat of the moment, you know, it seems easy, right? But in the heat of the moment, people are like, oh, shit, I ain't touching that, man. We don't know what's going to happen. The world's going to blow up. The next day is going to blow up. You know, who oh, knows yeah. what? Listen, in, in the in the 1987 crash, there was a big discount to cash as well. But the problem there was that all of the uh, houses that had been doing the index ARB had actually bought stocks, sold, sorry, bought futures, sold stocks. And what had happened is they'd done it a couple of days earlier. And then as the market fell, their S&P 500 futures were marking to market. So they were having to come up with margin. But meanwhile, the stock sale back then it was T plus five. It actually was going to settle in a week's time. So there was a huge cash flow problem. And then what happened is all those guys got told, no, you can't do any index ARB anymore. And that's right. when that just completely blew out. It's probably something similar in this case where people were so scared and they were just like, no, no, you got to just stay out of the way. This bag's going out. I mean, why take career risk? You know what I mean? Let's yeah. just lift the trade tomorrow, I guess. Right. Yeah. But it's great opportunity for you. Okay. So now go, let's fast forward. back. Yeah, which to is only because the guys that I convinced to let me do it probably <laughs> didn't even understand it. So. <laughs> Um, so fast forward back to the, uh, 2000 and is this the point where you go and you try to, and you get it actually not just try, but you get a job at commodities court. No, no. I, I, in 2000, I went and worked for a prop shop in Chicago. And so had you already worked at commodities corp up to when did, when was that? No. Um, I got a job prop in Chicago. I left, I joined, I guess you would call it a hedge fund, although questionable, but a, a fund in, in New York city where I worked at for about a year and um, I left there at the end of the year um, and they basically fired me and I was, I'm not kidding. You, there were five people there and four lost money all the year I was there and one made money and that was me and they fired me. <laughs> so Th Those guys, those guys ended up by the way, going to jail. Um, but so it was a good thing they fired me, but they fired me. I had no job. I, uh, my wife thought I was a loser and uh, we were going to get divorced. And I went to a divorce attorney. I lived in Princeton area at the time. And the divorce attorney was like, you know, um, and this is such a story of, you just never know what's gonna happen in life, you know? But uh, I went to this divorce attorney and he said, what do you do? I said, I'm a trader. He said, do you know Helmut Weimer? I said, I don't know him, but I know of him, having read Market Wizards 800 times, right? And he said, oh, you know, my wife is, is best friends with his wife. And I was like, okay. Uh, if you want to be my divorce attorney, get on the phone with your wife right now, and I want to sit down and meet Helmut Weimer. Um, and, and and the next day, I did. And I never worked for Commodities Corporation. I, I actually had interviewed with Commodities Corporation a few years earlier, and they they didn't take me. But um, Helmut had just sold Commodities Corporation to Goldman, and uh, he still had his office uh, over there. So I sat in his office with him um, and he got what I was talking about immediately and uh, he backed me with some money and he brought me into what was then Goldman um, and they- So you ended they, up at Goldman? Well, they, yeah, right. <laughs> they ended up uh, matching what, what he gave me. Um, and so I went and started sort of a, a CTA with Helmet and, and Goldman's money, which wasn't a lot of money, I can tell you, but- um, so for those who don't know, Commodities Corp is actually, uh, it was founded by Helmut Weimar and Amos Hostetter. I hope I'm saying that correct. 
And there's yeah. just like some famous folks came from there. Paul Tudor Jones, Louis Bacon, Bruce Kovner, uh, Michael Marcus, Ed Sakota, and Marty Schwartz. And I just, I know you weren't there. You didn't overlap with any of them, but I'd love to just kind of get your impressions of trading with helmet. What he was like, what the kind of anything you can give us in terms of color of that firm. So I didn't trade with helmet. I I managed his money. Okay. Um, And I did talk to him quite a bit. He, what I would say about helmet is that he uh, never once told me what to trade made a comment on what I'm doing, nothing. It was always there if I wanted to talk to him, um, but was uh, such a, so professional in the way that he handled things. You know, he, to this day, is maybe, well, some other people have done it since, but for a long time, he was the only person who ever bought my drawdowns, right? Oh. <laughs> Most people, you have, a, you have a drawdown on yeah, a yeah. bail, right? Yeah. He bought, he bought my drawdowns three different times, um, and was paid every time you know um because he understood trading you know draw down if if you believe that something is going to work over time which is the only reason you're giving somebody money if you understand the process and you believe the process is going to work over time and you understand that drawdowns are a natural process to anything right then you buy those drawdowns and he did that three different times that's fascinating that's awesome that's 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 great because usually everyone goes the other way around they're redeeming you into the drawdowns which is why they suck and he's great. <laughs> no, which is why everybody else has horrible returns. I mean, truthfully, right? Yeah, no, there's no limit of it's that. It's just like what we do in the markets. They sell right at the wrong time and they buy. You know, they chase it when, when you're doing great and then they bail when you're doing horrible, right? Okay, so you you go through these periods, you manage money for different people and stuff. And now maybe we should kind of go to where like i'm just trying to think of how much more we want should we should we talk about like your next stages like eventually yeah let's go into this eventually you uh kind of almost retire if i if i'm correct right you sell the house uh, so you 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 sell the firm you no longer trade and you find yourself living in rhode island on a farm is that correct i worked at a big hedge fund i left the and that was the first time in my life that i ever really got to a point i worked there for like five or six years i did well and i left there and that was the first time I ever really in my life had some form of financial security. Okay. Um, I went and started my own fund and did that for about two years and w- was having the dream of, you know, I could be whatever, the next billionaire. I can go raise, you know, ha- all this money and started this firm with all these people working for me and a huge, you know, carry every month. And it ended up being uh, absolute hell. Um, and during it is when I actually did get divorced. So it just got to a point where I was like, screw all this. I shut it down. I got divorced. I moved up to Rhode Island and I took about, uh, I don't know, almost a year and a half off. Right. And just kind of, uh, as I say, I, I kind of went through and I, I bought a farm and, you know, figured I'd go outside and chop wood. And of course, the first day I went and chop wood, I threw out my back and that was the end of that. Um, but, you know, I just kind of took a year and a half off. All right. And so what revelation did you come after that year and a half? Like what brought you back to the market? I mean, this is what I do. You know, yeah. this is, this is what I love to do. This is what I think if there's anything that I could consider myself good at, um, this is it. So why, you know, why, why not? All right. Like let's, let, let, let's get back into it. Right. Um, so I went to a place that, allocate some money to traders, a, a prop shop that I had some friends that had managed money for, and um, they let me manage some money. And I started doing that, and uh, I was pretty happy doing that, to be honest with you. But at one point, I had a friend who approached me and said, you know, why don't I raise you some money? And I was like, you know, I don't even have a company. Man. I don't even have a CTA. I have nothing. I'm just one man trading this one account. But if you want to go ahead and try, then then go ahead. And he did, and he was successful. So I started this uh, CTA, which I knew I knew how to do because I had done it before more than once. Yeah. Um, and you know, took this money in, and, and have been now doing that since uh, since then. So it's been I don't know, about six, seven years now for this latest CTA, and uh, and that's what I do now. All right, now let's get into your um, kind of process and what you talk about, and and why don't you tell us wh- when crowded market report came about and like what the purpose of it is and maybe kind of how it, it kind of 
meshes with your thinking and just kind of give us a little bit of uh, background in terms of that portion of the, your career. I'm sorry, you're asking about the crowded market report? Yeah. Is that what yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, you know, when I was in Schrager's book, um, all of a sudden I started getting a lot of people sending me stuff like on LinkedIn, you know, yeah, like every day, five, 10 people every day. Right. Uh, hey, Jason, can you teach me how to trade? Hey, can I come and work for you for free and learn how to trade? Hey, yeah. And um, I do. And one of the things that I learned from Helmet um, is, is you do want to. And it's part of, I think, the trading lure, right? You want to pass the whole thing forward to, to other people, right? Um, so I do want to do that. But I kept saying to these people, listen, I, I'd love to, but I don't know how I'm going to choose from 200 people. I, I can't mentor 200 people at the same time, right? I have a family. I have a job. You know, I have a life. So I, I just don't know how I'm going to do that. And one guy said to me, well, why don't I start a web page and, and you can sort of centralize that. And I had always written for 20 years. I've been writing this sort of thing on the weekend. That was really for me. Um, that puts my thoughts down on paper. This is what I'm looking at. These are the trades that I'm looking at. This is what it's going to take for me to make the trade. You know, that kind of thing. Okay. Just to keep me, just to keep me disciplined. And at one point I turned that when I was working at a hedge fund, I turned that into a newsletter that went to like some of the, the portfolio managers there and a bunch of them liked it. When I managed my CTA after that, a, a few of my clients were hedge fund managers themselves. Um, and so I used to send it to them and a few of them really liked it. So I said to the guy, look, if you want to start a web page, that's great. Why don't we do, uh, we can just distribute this newsletter that, that I do every week, right? right? And, and, that, and that'll help people to understand. And that's what we did. And then he, along with that, started a uh, Discord page, which I quite frankly didn't know what that was. Um, being the old man that I am. Um, but I'm sure you know, it, it's just like a little chat page or whatever. So people started to join and they get this newsletter and, and they, and we kept the price, you know, very reasonable for people to be able to afford. And they get this newsletter and, and we get on the, uh, on the discord and we, we talk about all these different things. And, you know, I'm really trying to push the idea there like I, I beg people like look i'm not trying to be a tip sheet here right if you're coming to me because you think i'm a market wizard and you think everything i say is going to be golden right you, you you're doing it wrong you know uh the, the things i'm trying to focus on with these people is what is actually important right risk management right having process having discipline these are the things that are important not some guru telling you to buy and sell shit all the time because that is not going to work right i don't care who it is right um so I try to, now I do put my trades on my newsletter because that's what it was based on from the very beginning was, was for me to monitor. But, uh, and I know that people try to mimic what I'm doing, but I beg them not to, because I'm like, it's not going to work, man. You, you didn't develop this process like I did. So you're not going to believe in it like I do, right? You don't have the history. I've got 20 years of trading this process. So I'm very comfortable with the, the, the drawdowns that come with it and the trades that lose and all. I'm very comfortable with all that. You're not going to be because you don't know this, right? So the first, you're going to come in and the first three trades you take are going to lose. And then you're going to stop and you're going to say, Shapiro is a moron. I wasted my money. And then the fourth trade is going to be a home run. And now we're four trades into it and you're down 3% and I'm up 3% and it, it, it's always going to be like that. Right. Right. So that is why you shouldn't, you know, I beg these people, like use the lessons that I have learned, right. I'm no different than you. I, I just might be a few years more advanced because of the years I've traded. Right. So I've already gone through what you're probably going through. So why don't you just use those lessons that I have learned through this um, to enhance your trading. Right. I'm always like you trade you and use what you can learn here. And you guys have the advantage. I tell them all the time uh, that you can use the stuff that I am showing you to enhance your trading. And you can also go out to two or four, four or five other people right. and use the stuff that they're teaching to it. And, and if you can get all these ideas to enhance your trading, I mean, you guys goals should not be to get my return. You should be better than me. Right. No, that's, um, that's great advice. All right. So let's talk a little bit about that process. And from the book, you said the most powerful word in the markets is despite. If you hear a comment like despite the increase in oil inventories being much higher than expected, oil prices closed higher. And that is the tape telling you what is going to happen. Why don't you kind of explain to us why you think that word despite is so important? So it starts with, you know, the fact that I'm looking to be opposite the masses, right? Okay. 
And I don't think that it's by any means going out on a limb saying that the masses over time lose money trading, right? If they're long only, they probably don't lose money because the stock market usually goes up, but they underperform the index, right? So that's losing money, in other words. But people who actually trade long short end up net losing money. So it's very simple for me. Like to me, if the masses are going to lose money, then all I want to do is go the opposite side of the masses and make the money that they're going to lose. You know, I'm not trying to outthink everybody, you know, because I can't do that. Um, I'm not trying to be smarter on the macro level. I'm not trying to be a better trader than everybody else. I'm just letting them tell me what they're doing and I'm taking the opposite side. That's it. it it's sort of like making markets in a way, right? Um, so it starts with that. Then once you have that, once you have a reading that everybody is one-sided onto something, then I look for this despite stuff, right? So even when everybody is one-sided, I'm still not going to take a trade just because of that. I, I need a market confirmation, which like I say, people should be using market confirmation no matter how they're trading, right? right. You might think, hey, this stock is going up. But you have to wait until it confirms that it's going up, right? Like what's the timing on it, right? Um, and, and confirm can mean whatever it is means to you. It went above the 20-day moving average or it went above the 50-day or the 200-day, whatever you, you want to use, right? There should be some form of confirmation into what you think before you actually act. So for me, what I use as a confirmation is this despite thing. I, I call it news failure, and that's actually a, a word that helmet invented for me okay. um but so despite yes the, the easiest one to look at is the lows in the stock market because everybody follows the stock market um the lows in october right came on a day when the cpi printed the highest number of the year right um and it was higher than expected right so despite the fact that cpi came in higher than expected right the market closed up right. that day okay and, and that was the low of the stock market up to this point. And so, so is it at that point that you start thinking about going the other way? Like, so from what I, I don't think about it, that's right when I do it. Okay. So you, you go and you wait for a situation where everyone's leaning one way. And then once the market starts to behave almost in the opposite way, that's your signal that it's all almost like all baked in. Correct. Right. And again, the reason it's baked in to me is because the discounting mechanism is not price. It's participation. So why didn't the market go down when the CPI was higher? Well, because everybody's already short. That's why. So that's the discounting mechanism. So when they've over discounted in the positioning, that's when I go the other way. And I don't think that any of this really, and I think that my trading history proves it, doesn't necessarily put the odds that the market is going to go up or down at any more what it really does it puts the odds that if i get it right the payout is going to be much higher than if i get it wrong yeah. like my trading for example is less than 50 50 I, I get less than 50 percent winners but the payout is like four to one so and, and i think that's what a lot of people miss in trading as well right that's to me what it's really about right it's not about your percentage of winners it's not about how right you are it's about can you get paid more on the ones that you're right than you lose on the ones that you're wrong. Right. I actually watched one of your videos and you mentioned that you said you your your trades have a 38% chance of winning. Is that just over time you figured that out? 20 years. That's what it's been, 38%. Right. And then and then what would you think your risk uh kind of loss to win ratio is on on your trades over time? It's about four to one. Okay, so those are the actual numbers. So you so yes. you so you lose a little bit less than quarter one, three point eight to one or something. Yeah. So you lose sixty two percent of the time, but when you lose, you lose a dollar, and then the thirty eight percent of the time you win, you 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 make four dollars. Correct. So lose a dollar, lose a dollar, make four. Lose a dollar, lose a dollar, make four. Lose a dollar, lose a dollar, make four. And let time pass. And so when you're doing a trade that you have, let's just say like so recently you you've turned bearish on the stock market. And I thought it was funny because you you uh, you tweeted out the other day that you said, "Wow, I didn't never knew how much engagement I get from being bearish on the stock market," and I was yeah. just laughing because you know doom always sells more. Um, but one of the things that I kind of I just I want to think this through is if you, so you're you're looking for this. Have you got the news failure, and what was the news failure on that made you put on the short right now? 
so a couple things that I, I would change what you would say. Okay. I didn't get I didn't get bearish. Okay. Um, my system, my process got me short. Okay. Okay. Um, to me, there's a difference, right? So Whether what I'm is bullish the difference? Bearish, why, do you, why do you tell? Because I'm not bearish at all. You know what I mean? But but my system did get me short. Now, having said that, as of today, data comes out on Friday for me. Yeah. I, I'm out of that trade. So it ended up like I got short the Dow. It looks like it was about, I don't know, I might have made like literally 30 points on this freaking trade. And it wasn't even worth it because it took three weeks to make 30 points on this trade. And I was out of the money more than I was in the money. But it did take me out today. So I am no longer short. But yeah, that Thursday, um, I believe that it was, you know, my, my data was set up uh, to be a sell. Um, and on that, I know it was a Thursday, July 27th, there was a reversal day in the stock market on the back of some some economic news that should have been positive, the stock market. Oh, so it was it a was despite. Like, it was a despite. It's always a despite. Oh, okay. It's always a despite. So... Despite that news, the market closed down. My stuff showed that people were too long the Dow. This is the first time I got short stocks all year. Um, and I got short. And it went in my face immediately for three days. And it kind of went for me. And this week, it just kind of flopped around. And then the data came out. And, and I'm out of it. And, and, and I'm more, it gets into a, a little bit more esoteric stuff of why I got out of it. But I, I kind of have a buy in the NASDAQ and a sell in the Dow. So... I can do both or I can just go flat, you know, and I just went flat. It's Friday afternoon and I'll think about it this weekend. I'll go through my charts. I'll go through my stuff and I'll decide what I want to do. Um, but uh, so right as of right now, I'm flat. So, and it's completely on that participation, which you use the caught report. And when, so you're, you going back to your market comment about I'm not bearish. I actually just had a signal. So do you try to not have views all the time? Like, is it basically you're trying to not go and have like some grandiose view and you're just saying, I'm waiting for this, I'm waiting for this. I think I, I think I always have views, but I don't trade on them. Ah, uh, okay. I, I, I trade my process. That's it. Right. I trade my process because it's impossible, right? It's impossible, right? As much as you want to meditate and as much as you want to be Zen and it's impossible to not have any views, right? Um, and then my views obviously get biased by what my stuff is doing, as anybody will do, right? You can always make a bullish case. You can always make a bearish case. And you can always make it sound super intelligent, right? Um, but it's all bullshit, you know? <laughs> so do you so, ever find yourself, like, having a, a view and then your system gives you the opposite signal and have difficulty pulling the trigger on that? This one. I, if you ask me, I am not bearish the stock market at all here, right? Right. Um, but I got short here. You know, I got short a few weeks ago, right? And I'm lucky to have gotten out of it, quite frankly, um, without a loss. But I am not bearish in the least the stock market. I can make a bearish argument, which I did in my, in my video last week. Right. But um, I don't particularly believe that, that that's the high probability thing of happening. <laughs> So uh, yes, I, I was short and, uh, and, uh, and, and I wasn't bearish whatsoever. Um, in the book, you talk about fading people and actually a lot of times you talk about either fading CNBC, uh, fast money, or, you know, people that you talk to that are kind of always seem to be wrong. Is, do you, do you kind of, how do you make that something that is a system as well? You can't really. No. Except, except that if the majority and the consensus is talking about something, yeah, th there's a good chance that then that shows up in the positioning data, right? Like right now, okay, all I hear every single day, the single most consensus thing that I hear about the markets here is energy. Everyone is bullish energy here right okay does that mean energy can't go up it doesn't mean energy can't go up to me it means that the risk reward on being long energy is horrible here um but the cot is showing that people are excessively long energy in particular as it turns out in heating oil right 
um, and I put the I just put the heating oil COT chart on on Twitter this afternoon when it came out. But so it, it kind of coincides most of the time anyway, right? Um, so you still people, you still wait for the signal on, on your systems as opposed to oh yeah okay, always so you're not always. actually going and fading the guys on CNBC. You're just saying that on the whole that kind of corresponds to the what you're going to see in terms of and, and it helps. You know, it, it really helps. You know, you talk about the psychology of you know how convinced are you about the thing and all that kind of thing. Um, it helps when when people that I listen when. When the consensus is talking all the same thing and my data is showing the same thing, it, it, it helps a lot psychologically, right? Um, just because I, I've watched these people over and over, over time, over long periods of time, be wrong. And, and it's more about really, it's about two things. Cons it's not necessarily one single person, but consensus when they're all coming up. You can't turn on the TV right now, I'm sorry, and have not have somebody tell you that they're bullish energy. I had the TV on today. There were probably six people that came on and said that. Okay. Um, so it's a consensus. And then there's also on a few individuals, and that's more about personality type, right? People who consistently talk about how they know more than the market, right? <laughs> um, and, and people that consistently show very typical behavioral biases, right? are people that you want to fade. This doesn't make them bad people, right? It just um, makes them good fades. <laughs> that's it. It's plain and simple, Yeah. right? doesn't mean that they're not great people to hang around with. I mean, I couldn't, being sort of contrarian anyway, but doesn't make them fun. It mean they're not fun. It doesn't mean they wouldn't be good to play golf with or whatever. It just means that they are exhibiting very typical behavior that is fadeable. That, that, that's all it means. Right. Um, so there are a few people that that uh, that fit into that very 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 well, and so I pay attention very closely to them. When it, when I was reading your uh, your chapter, one of the things that kind of struck me was how similar you are to one of another one of my kind of idols, which is Mark Fisher, uh, the energy trader. And he says, if it makes sense, it doesn't make you any money. And I think that part of people not understanding that the more obvious a trade is, the kind of the more likely it is to be priced in is is difficult for them to kind of grasp their their hands around and but i think when we had 2021 because we had such a fierce rally and the in a lot of stuff i found it difficult at the very least that a lot of the things in terms of the markets being priced in and being more efficient weren't actually working i mean that in the old days, like you'd go, you see CNBC go on, someone gets on CNBC, an analyst, and they talk about a stock and it rallies two bucks, but the reality is nothing's really changed. By the end of the day, it kind of comes back in. But 2021 was kind of just an unbelievable period because it just kept going. And it didn't seem like the things that had previously worked just all of a sudden didn't work and it, it, something that could get overbought and it seemed like everyone was already in, just got more and more people in. Is this a case where you're looking for that move, the price action to confirm keeps you out of trouble on those kind of years? Yes. I mean, I could get into what you're saying first anyway, but the answer is absolutely yes. I think one of the key things, and I miss a lot of trades, okay, because of this. I miss market turns all the time, but it keeps me out of trouble. And, and that's so important, you know, not losing money is Oh, it's, just as important as not making money. It might money, even be right? more important. It might even be yeah, more important. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. So it keeps me out of trouble. I, I missed a trade just barely recently, okay, um, where uh, on Coco, Coco went from just this week over 3,600 to 3,300 in four days, okay? That's what, a 10% move or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, and I missed it because of one little tiny thing in my system. I missed it. Okay. Um, it happens. I, I also wasn't shorting it from, you know, 3000 all the way up to 36. So for that same reason. So, you know, I, first of all, Mark Fisher obviously is, is a trading legend, yeah. right? Um, and he's, in my view, absolutely right. If it's obvious, then where in the world can something be obvious that you're going to make money, right? <laughs> but it was so frustrating in 2021 because it actually seemed to work. No, but but did it? Did it? Because in 2021, sure, the market 
kept going up, but all that crap topped in like what? March, April? Yeah, I guess so. All the crap with all those people were chasing, and I know people that were doing it too. I know I have friends who who were all of a sudden trading the market and all that stuff, and they weren't buying S&P, man. They were buying all that crap. They're buying space. You know? And all that crap yeah. started going down very early, right? And by like the second quarter of the year, it had already been going down, and then it, by the time the end of the year came, that shit was down 60%, 70%, right? Now, and, and, and just as an aside, we got short, or I got short, I wasn't short for all. And again, this is not me. I will say it's not me. It's COT, right? The COT had me long for the majority of 2021. Um, it flipped me. After, I don't remember exactly, but it flipped me from like NASDAQ to S&P and then to Russell um, and got me short in November of 2021. Oh, that's true. And that's not me. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is just the data. So that's when it got me short. So like you say, you might have been seeing that this is ridiculous, but it would have kept you away from doing that all the way until November. Okay. Now um, let's talk a little bit more about the COT data, because I know there's a lot of folks that are highlighting the fact that the bond short is as big as it's been, right? But one of the problems with some of the COT data is that there's different types of strategies. And although I have no doubt that the CTA guys are short, fixed income. There's another group of hedge funds that are actually short the futures because they're doing the basis trade. And I think that that's actually messing up the data. I was wondering, you know, do you agree with that? Or do you think this COT data is, is, is kind of don't second guess it. If it's, if it's showing that much short, it's that short. Like, do you think that that's real? And, and how do you account for things like the basis trade? I think it is real. Um, the amount of shorts on fixed income from that point of view, let's take the commercials, the amount of longs and fixed income and commercials is, and has been for a number of months now, completely out of control, the largest ever. Okay. Um, so you would think that would mean I'd be looking to buy. All right. Except there's three people or, or three groups in the commitments of traders, right? There's commercials. There's large speculators, as I call them, which are people that have to report their positions. Yeah. And then there are small speculators, which is everybody else, right? Okay. Um, and the small, and, and I need for me to put on a trade, if I'm going to go long, I need the commercials to show super long. And I need the small speculators and the large speculators to, so, to show super short. What's kept me out of this particular trade is the small speculators have not gotten short. They've been long the whole way. Right. So could, the, could so, you not? So I can't. I can't get long because of that. Could you not argue that the part of the reason is that because that's actually the speculative position because some of the, let's just say the basis trade is affecting the large speculators because the large speculators are actually short against a basis trade. I don't even want to argue because the data is the, what the data is. So you just is, don't care. Yeah. You just. And I know, and I have been no, and I have been making that argument for months in my newsletter. I've been saying yes. I see this, okay? But first of all, the small speculative thing is keeping me out anyway, so I don't care. But let's talk about it just for the sake of talking about it. There's no question that the basis trade is going on. And I don't even know what the hell the basis trade is, quite frankly. I, I ain't smart enough to understand it. But I know it's out there because I, I read about it and I hear about it, right? Um, and on top of that, now it goes right back to the other thing you were talking about. My number one favorite public guy, Fade, my number one Fade by far, okay, yeah. has for the last three, four months, this is the same guy who was shorting the stock market the entire way up this year, yeah. shorting the video the entire way up this year, right? Um, shorting the cues the entire way up this year, gave up on all that and started doing the same exact thing, getting long TLT. <laughs> and then TLT goes down, he's buying more, and he's buying more, and he's buying more, right? So when I look at all those things together, right? First of all, I can't do it anyway because of the small speculator situation, right? right? And when I test this data on fixed income, small speculators are the worst of everybody. So I, I ain't getting long with their law. I'll get long when they get short, right? But on top of that, I've got this guy who I love the fade who's buying TLT the whole way, right? Yeah. So it's kept me out of that trade. Okay, I get it. So why even bother with the large specs if the small specs are better? Like, why not just completely run your systems on the small specs? Well, the, the combination of the three is the best. Okay, I see. 
Right. I get it. Um, okay. Let me just, uh, you also have a story uh, in your book where you overrode the system. And I just, I just, <laughs> I want to tell you a quick kind of aside when in, in I'm a Canadian and uh, we, when we automated our, our market on clothes, we figured out a way we could actually go and read in the imbalances. And then I made a program that would just buy them and like buy the ones that were going had MOCs and then sell them into the MOC and sell the short, the ones that were for sale and buy them into the MOC. And I used to laugh because some days I would get nervous and I would go, Oh no, there's a big rebalance. Let's not do it or whatever. And the guy I would trade with, he goes, there you go. Adding negative alpha again. And uh, cause I was overriding the system do you ever override the system? And do you think that you actually add positive alpha and you're not like me? Do I ever override? Yes. I would argue right now I'm overriding my system because I have a signal to be short Dow still. Um, but I covered that today. Um, but that's because I also have a signal to be long NASDAQ, right? So I just choose to go flat. So in a way, that's overriding the system. My NASDAQ says, signal hasn't given me the buy yet, right? It's set up to buy, but it hasn't bought, right? So theoretically, I'm supposed to be short Dow. Not theoretically. I am supposed to be short Dow, right. okay? Um, but again, on top of the fact that my favorite fade is continuously shorting the Qs. So, and that's great. This will give me the chance to buy the NASDAQ when the time is right. Okay. And I feel strongly that that's going to work. But that, on top of the fact that the market's been going down and the Dow hasn't gone down, so the tape has not been good, you know, all these things have just led me to sort of, I think, what you would call override the system here. Right. But you're. Does it happen? Things like that will happen a few times a year, two, three times a year, right? Does it work for me? We'll wake up Monday morning and the Dow will be down a thousand points. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know that it works for me necessarily, but it helps me with my risk. So therefore it works for me. Right. So uh, are your overrides always not taking signals or flattening a position and never going the other way and actually adding up? Yeah. Like I don't take trades. Right. I will not open a new trade. That's not system related you know i get it so unless the that, system I would never, lets, that i would never do sometimes i'll take some more you know based on my portfolio and what my portfolio looks like you know yeah. i might take something off if i have too many correlated things going on right and actually um, that's my next on the, that's my next question ahead. i wanted to ask you because you mentioned the correlations do you actually measure them out like you you mentioned that you'll reduce risk if your correlations are too all one-sided are you just looking at how your portfolio behaves? Are you analyzing it, putting it through something, or is it just kind of a gut feel? Like, how do you go about um, changing your portfolio when you feel like your systems have you too lopsided one way? I think that uh, I don't. I used to run it through, you know, value at risk and all that yeah. stuff, but I found I found that to be crap. Yeah, okay, okay. it's too too slow. Um, by the time that thing figures it out, it's too late, right? right. So I, uh, I like to believe, I don't know if this is true, but I like to believe the reason I sit here all day and watch the markets, right, when I really don't need to because I'm trading a process anyway and it is what it is, right? But I like to believe the reason I'm doing that is because I'm watching correlations, right? And, and I'm trying to understand correlations across markets based on sort of how people are looking at the macro thing and what does the dollar mean to bonds, mean to stocks, mean to commodities, Right so that I can kind of have an understanding for the correlation so that I can then watch my portfolio so that it doesn't get too one-sided on a correlation thing, right? It's obvious to say, and truthfully, this isn't always obvious, and it wasn't obvious earlier this year, but in general, let's say I get a signal to buy the S&P, buy the Dow, buy the NASDAQ, and buy the Russell, right? Am I going to buy full positions in all four of those things? I mean, no, because it's pretty much the same trade, right? So on a correlation basis, same kind of idea. It really comes down most of the time to risk on, risk off type of thing, right? I mean, I, I like to trade the grains and things like that because there really is no correlation. So it offers me sort of non-correlated trades in there. But if you're doing the financials and some of the major things like gold and all that, you know, there, there, there's a correlation across the fixed and the dollar and all that. So I, I like to pay attention to that because I then adjust my portfolio um, 
that way. And right? again, do you only reduce as opposed to add positions? I I reduce. Right. Okay. I, I might reduce or I might say I get Dow, S and P, Nasdaq, uh, all of these things at the same time. Yeah. I'll either put them all on or they reduce size. You know, is usually what I'll do. Okay. Um, and and that depends on whether I have other trades on that are sort of risk off trades too, right? If I have some risk off trades on, well, then maybe I, I can full size all those because I have the risk off on the other side, right? If I don't have the risk off on the other side, well, then I'm not going to fully position. And arguably, if they're all showing the same thing, that people are super short all these indices, then the odds that they're going up is probably greater. So I probably should ride the full position all of them, but I don't do that because I always assume I'm going to be wrong. So it's all about risk to me, right? If I'm right, I'm going to make a shitload of money anyway. So if I'm wrong, I, I, I got to make sure that I, I don't do anything stupid. All right. You said in the book, you can always, you know, it can always be wrong. I don't care how good your system, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, can, it can always be wrong and you better be ready for it. Uh, you said in the book, money isn't everything. And then happiness was your true goal. Like, and you managed to stay happy through some kind of very tumultuous times. Um, was that like a decision you made or is that something in your makeup or is with, was it the way you were raised? I just love to hear kind of your thoughts on, on why you were able to stay happy even as you went up and down with the yo-yo. <laughs> I think that if nine out of 10 people that the, that you would ask right now would tell me, tell you I'm miserable. No, you're the- not. You, I, I can tell you're not. And not only that, you kept getting up like you, you know, you, you blew your account up probably more so than, than some. And at the very least, and yet you kept, you know, getting up for the, another pitch at the bat. The bad. At- yeah. I mean, what, what, what's that saying? Uh, if something is the, uh, I forget, but uh, in other words, there's no cho- I had no choice. So, you know what I mean? We can romanticize it, but the, the bottom line is I had no choice because I, I wanted to eat and um, nobody was giving me a job because I was such a, Nobody wants to sit next to a con- you know, someone that's controlling about everything that they have to say, right? Okay, but you're you're, but, um, okay, you're also just selling yourself short, I think, because you you went to what you went to a Buddhist monk place for a month. You've you've thought this through. You've made a decision to the, about how you want to live your life and stuff. Well, can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, I, I you know, it's not everyone that went, goes for a month and doesn't talk and 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 hangs out with the monks. I think it's important. I mean, this gets into a very deep philosophical conversation, but yes, I, I, I think that it's important to, and I don't think that I'm inventing anything here, okay, but it, it's important to keep things in perspective, and uh, and and one is the other. You know, there, there's a question here, um, uh, what would you believe was it if there's any ingredient you used to believe was essential for success professionally personally that you no longer think is crucial at all right yeah so i think the answer to that question gets into what you're getting at right what i have found and i don't really believe that anybody who's young could understand this but as you get older as i've gotten older at least i have come to learn and I don't mean this in any kind of religious way or any kind of philosophical way. I think it is fact, right? That the more that you give in this life, the more you receive, right? When you're young, you think the more I take, the more I receive. I have to go out and take it. That's how I'm going to get rich. That's how I'm going to be successful. That's how I'm going to have all the things that I want, right? I'm going to go out and take it. And I thought that too when I was young. And and the more I've gotten older, um the more I have come to believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that the more you give, the more you receive. I I think you leave this world, it's efficient. So if you are taking, 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 you're going to have taken back from you as well. And it's not to say that people aren't greedy and haven't taken, taken, and have become billionaires, and that looks great, but they're miserable. The family hates them. They have no happiness, right? But they have a billion dollars. Terrific. But I have found that the more you give, the more the more you receive. Not only yes in business, okay. You want to give as much as you can to your clients, the people you do business with. I would say I want people that I do business with in every sense of the word to make money because 
you know, that's what people, then they want to do business with me, right. right? Nobody wants to do business with something they don't make money with, right? I can sit there and squeeze my brokers to the last penny, right? But then as soon as something goes wrong, they're going to be there to help me, you know? Um, the guy in The Godfather said it, right? What was it like? You know, he's still around because everybody he's done business with has made money, right? Um, so I, I think that's, and people aren't going to listen to this. They're going to think I'm, I'm some sort of religious freak, which I'm not. I'm not an atheist, but I, I truly have come to believe that the more you give, the more you receive. So I'm trying to go out there and help and give to as many people as I can, my, whoever I can. And, and it's not to say that somebody and a number of people won't take advantage of that. They'll, they'll, they'll take what you're giving them and they'll use you and then they'll, they'll screw you. Yes, there are people like that, but you know what? They're, if that's the way they're going to approach stuff, they're going to have that come back to them and get screwed. Right. I, I promise you. I've seen it again and again and again, right? And and I didn't do this when I was raising my kids. I, I wasn't great with, with them when I was a kid. I was in a bad marriage and all that. But you give, give, give to your kids and you will receive, receive, receive love. You give, give, give to your wife, which I didn't do to my first wife because we, didn't, we hated each other. But I, I try as hard as I can to do that with my second wife. Give, give, give. I live to give to her. And, and what I get back in return is just unmeasurable, right? And it's, it works the same way in business. And, and even this whole crowded market report that I, that I started, people are like, oh, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? I'm like, look, man, I am trying. Whether, whether I'm good at what I do or whether what I do makes sense or helps people, I like to think it does. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. But I am trying to give to people. They want to make money. They want right. to learn how to trade. I think I know a little something about that, so I'm trying to give to them, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's like they, it, it's part of this whole thought process. So that's really what I believe in. Uh, I'm sure people will think I'm some sort of you know, loony, but I, 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 it, the proof is in the pudding, right? Yep. When I started to take that approach in life, things got immeasurable better for me. It's the famous song, the, the Beatles, the end. It says, the, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Um, okay. A hundred, a hundred percent. All right. So let's go with our five questions. Let's start with your favorite book, your favorite investment book. Sorry. Uh, to me, the market wizard books are, you know, it's, yeah, I understand I'm in one of them, but the, in particular for three market wizards books, I think it's market wizards one market wizards two and hedge fund market wizards to me are the best trading books you could ever read. I, my process of trading, I, I like to believe it is just my conclusion to market when there's one. That's all it is. It's all these guys talk about. Don't flight the tape. Be contrarian as possible. Wait for market confirmation. I didn't invent any of this. It's all right in that book. Right. And who better to take advice from than, you know, Kovner, Tudor, Marcus. I mean, you know. Got it. All right. Um, let's talk about uh, Byron Ween surprise. Uh, Byron Ween uh, had his famous kind of year end surprises where he talked about something he thought the market had a, was giving a one third or would give a one third chance of happening. But he actually thought there was a better than 50 50 chance of occurring. Do you have a Byron Ween surprise for us? I think that the big surprise here to me is still the idea that people still think inflation means the Fed's raising rates, and that's bad for the stock market. So lack of inflation means the Fed's going to stop raising rates, and that's good for the stock market, right? I think that the surprise, because of that's the way they're thinking, is that the most bearish thing that happens here is the Fed starts cutting rates. I, I, I truly believe, and I was way, way, way early in believing this, okay, because I was saying it last year that the market is going to top when the Fed stops raising rates, and I thought that was going to be last October. Well, we're now entering this October and they still haven't stopped raising rates, right? Yep. But the the story remains the same, even though it's a year later. I think the market is going to top the very first time they cut rates. Now, I, first of all, the problem is they're not telling us that, right? I, it's going to be a long time before they cut rates. So therefore, the market may not top for a very long time, right? Um, but I think that's the surprise. Is the, That's the most bearish thing that can happen is the Fed stops raising rates because that's when you're going to get you know, that's when you're going to get the yield curve go from inverted to the other way, right? Which means that, and you're already starting to get that, right? 10-year rates where people really borrow money, 30-year rates where people really borrow money are going to go up. And that's when you're going to get your recession that everybody's looking for. And that's when you're going to get your stock market to go down, right? Yeah. It's when they cut rates. You know, right now they're raising rates. So the, the, the curve goes inverted because everyone is 
looking in the future and discounting in that inflation will go away and growth will go away. The second they stop that, it's go and you see it every time. Every time there's any rumor that they're going to stop, gold goes up, bonds go down, right? So I think that's the big surprise. Cutting rates is the worst thing that is ever going to happen here. Okay, so now uh, John Cox used to say that you shouldn't invest on what's on page one today, but what's on page 16 on the way to page one tomorrow. Do you have any trades so you might get the Don Cox seal of approval? I think that's the same one. I, I think it's the same answer. All right. And what advice would you give to a young person starting in the business today? Law school. The law school? Yes. Why law school? <laughs> like avoid the avoid our industry. <laughs> yes. Go to law school. That, that's that's the advice I would give someone that wants to start in this industry. Go to law school. Okay, now we're, we're going to make a bunch of money as a lawyer and take your savings. And if you want to trade, go ahead, right? But in the meantime, you have a nice income as a lawyer. Yeah, well, I think that people underestimate when you're learning trading how difficult or, or how much it helps to have that nice income that you can rely on, right? That, uh, without a doubt. Yeah. I think people's view, especially a young person, including me as a young person, is 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 just nowhere near reality. I don't think people understand how counterintuitive and how difficult this whole thing is. Yeah. Right? It's not like, oh, I'm just going to put money in the market, and the fact that I'm putting money in the market means I'm going to be making money. Wrong. Right? Uh, over 95% of people lose money doing this. You can spend hours and hours and hours and hours a day and lose money. You, you can't do it as a lawyer. You're booking $400 right. an hour when you're a lawyer one way or the other. And sometimes, right? uh, you know, people figure out ways to take advantage of those 95% of them losing by creating systems to fade them systematically. They try. <laughs> All right. So now you've already mentioned the question that was asked by the Toggle founder, Jan, last week, because we're playing this new game where, uh, we have kind of a pay it forward question, but he had two parts to his question. So I'm going to play his asking both questions. And I think you've already answered the first one, but the second one you have to answer. So let's first play it one second. Here we go. So I'll, uh, I'll give you two and you can then decide which one you think is, is, is more applicable since I don't know who your guest is going to be. But the first one is, um, the first one is more serious. The second one is a little bit more fun. Um, okay. the, the first one is, is there any ingredient you used to believe was essential for success professionally or personally that you no longer think is crucial at all? So like something that you've changed your mind on, something that people told you was absolutely critical and now you think it's not important at all? That's a great question. Um, and then the second one, which is a little bit more fun, is like if you had to meal eat the same meal for the rest of your life, what would that be? All right. So you, I so think, yeah. the first one we kind of answered, although I would guess I would add to that fundamental analysis. Okay. Would be my second answer to that first question. Meaning that you thought uh, it was important and it's not nearly as important as you thought? Correct. Okay. Simply because the market discounts it in. So what, what value does it add, right? right? Paying attention to what others are thinking is the fundamental analysis is important, but doing your own fundamental analysis and, and thinking that it's going to be better than, than everything that's out there is ridiculous in my view. Okay. Um, the second question, if I had to eat the same meal for the rest of my life, what would that be? Yeah. I, I don't know. I eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich pretty much every single Come day. Come on. So let's go. Is that what you yeah, eat so at lunch every go. day? Just about every day. Yeah. <laughs> So, so let's go ahead with that one. I, I've lived on that since I was in first grade, so we'll, we'll keep going with that one. Okay, so now you got to give us our question for the next guest. So if it's an investment person, you know, or even not, but I, I, I always ask people, what are you doing that's different to what other people are doing? Because otherwise, how else are you going to add you know, extra returns if you're not doing something that's different? Okay. We're going to, we're going to put the screws to the next guy. <laughs> All right. Listen, Jason, it's been a real pleasure having you. Why don't you tell people where they can find you and uh, the crowded market report and uh, kind of give us the whole spiel. Yeah. So our website is crowdedmarketreport.com. Um, they can also go on YouTube. I, I do videos. I try to do them at least once a week or I try to do them once a week and those are all free. Uh, crowded market report 
on YouTube, uh, also on Twitter. Um, trying to think what the Twitter handle is, but it's because there's like been a whole bunch of people that have uh, that have made fake ones. Do you want to do your own? Because I can give yeah, you yours. Please. Are you? Okay, so let me just look, because here you are. You're at the crowded underscore MKT underscore RPT. Right. Very so on catchy. Twitter there, too, I don't, uh, you know, I put certain things on there a little bit, but um, I, I think I do a lot more on YouTube because I, I, I put, like, these 10-minute videos together. And I, most of it, yeah, they're most great. of it is not talking I, about not here's what the market's going to do. It's more about here's what I think the market is about right that type of thing and then like i say the the the, the uh the newsletter and all that and the discord is all available crowdedmarketreport.com and we also created you, you can get commitments of traders charts on the internet for free um but we created some really really good charts i have to say i didn't do it the guy who started it did my partner um he, he created some really good uh commitment of traders charts because the ones we were using weren't that good. And so he went out and created some really good ones. And that's part of what we do on there too. So that's terrific. Well, Jason, it was a great getting to know you and I really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was real fun.